first lecture uh, and clinical practice will become apparent once we actually start to talk about treatment. Uh, these are my disclosures, the relevant ones are a circle. Um, before we talk about age-related macro degeneration, we have to think about aging uh, because the changes in age-related macro degeneration are superimposed on the changes associated with aging. Aging except affects cells and it affects the extracellular of our matrix. The way it affects cells is through oxidative damage to the mitochondria, which alters proliferation of cells, and it's associated with overexpression of extracellular matrix components, which as you know is one of the features of macro degeneration. It also, uh, aging affects the extracellular matrix biochemically. Uh, the Maillard reaction is a reaction in which carbonyl groups uh, of uh, sugars interact with amino groups proteins to make linkages, creating molecules called advanced glycation end products. And these molecules are very toxic to cells, and in particular to RT cells. Um, so this is just aging, and aging is not the same as age-related macular degeneration, as I'm sure you know, because you can be 100 years old and not have age-related macular degeneration. So uh, what is age-related macular degeneration? It's, it's a condition in which there's accumulation extracellular debris of, on both sides of the RPE basin of membrane. And the clinical manifestations include drusen, atrophy of the photoreceptors, the RPE and the photocapillaris, uh, and of course other features like coronia vascularization and pigment epithelial detachment. Onset is after age 50. And in, in the United States, it's the leading cause of blindness, actually. Now, there are some other diseases that have some of these features, for example, Scarborough disease, but it doesn't occur at this age, and it has a very specific genetic origin. And um, Molecular Ventinase, which also has a different natural history. Um, and um, Sorbis, Sorbis B. fundus uh, dystrophy, which has very many similar features, but a totally different age of onset. So all of these features uniquely define the diseases that we currently identify with a single name What I'm going to tell you about pathogenesis is actually summarized in this slide and the next slide. But I thought I would show you the overview first and then show you the data behind it. So we start with chronic oxidative damage, which is a feature, as you know, now of aging. And that leads to damage of the photoreceptors, the RPE cells, and the choreocapillaris. And it also leads to abnormal changes in those membrane. And there are certain age-related pigments, like glycocusin, which can exacerbate oxidative damage. Well, the oxidative damage to these cells initiates an inflammatory response, initially involving the, the innate immune system, the complement system, but eventually involving the acquired immune system, the T cells and G cells. And, and inflammatory responses also induce oxidative damage. And eventually, when there's enough damage, we begin to see the accumulation of abnormal extracellular debris and modification of the extracellular matrix, which of course unfortunately precipitates additional inflammatory damage. And this is where the role of complement abnormalities probably plays a role in increasing the risk for age-related macular degeneration, as you see. Eventually we see the clinical manifestations of drusen and pigmentary changes. So we call these changes, early changes, drusen and pigmentary changes, but they're not early actually in the disease pathogenesis. They're only early in terms of our clinical recognition. And then through mechanisms that are still being worked out, we eventually can end up with atrophy or corrosion vessels. These are not mutually exclusive outcomes. Um, about a third of the patients that have geographic atrophy histologically have corrosion vessels. Now, with this in mind, you can understand completely all the different types of treatments that are being uh, used to try to treat the disease. So antioxidants to manage oxidative damage, visual cycle inhibitors like the Nixisac to reduce um, the uh, free radical production that precipitates oxidative damage, anti-inflammatory drugs like the complement inhibitors, none of which have been successful so far, uh, and neuroprotectants, uh, and then, of course, anti-neovascular agents. So now let me go through the, the real data underlying this concept, starting with Brooks memory. So, um, both in age and in age-related macular degeneration, we see changes in Brooks membrane. 
But in, in the age-related macular degeneration, we see exacerbated changes. So thickening of Brooks membranes in age-related change. But in age-related macular degeneration, we see basal linear deposit, which is this abnormal material uh, external to the orbital basal membrane, and basal laminar deposit, which is um, the material that's between the RPE cell and the base membrane, it's right there. Uh, we also see protein cross-linking and abnormal protein deposition. Uh, for example, you can see here uh, C3A and C5A deposition. These are activated complement components within Drusen and within Brooks membrane. Uh, and we see lipidization of Brooks membrane. These are cholesterol esters labeled with oral red O and using polarized and hot station microscopy. Um, and the lipidization of Brooks membrane, of course, affects its hydraulic conductivity and also its, its permeability to amino acids. And then finally, you see a toxic accumulation of products in Brooks membrane, like advanced glycation end products. So if we just step back and look at the Brooks membrane of a 10 year old versus a 91 year old, this is the RP based membrane, this is the scanning electron micrograph. You can see the intercollagenous layer has a lot of open spaces when we're young, but when we get to be older, Virtually all those spaces are gone, they're filled with debris. The, his, the ultrastructure of basal laminar deposit is shown here. You can see that it's, um, as I mentioned, located between the RP basal membrane and the plasma membrane of the RP cells. And it has this wide space collagen, which is in the circle, as well as some vesicles. And that looks different from basal linear deposit, which is much more specific for age related macular degeneration. Uh, basal linear deposit is external to the RP basal membrane. But within the inner collection of square roots membrane. And it mostly has coated and uncoated vesicular material. There are other materials that accumulate in Brooks membrane. For example, amyloid, non-cribular amyloid uh, oligomers occur in Drusen, as shown here. And uh, mature amyloid fibrils occur in Drusen. Those are, these are the green structures shown here. And amyloid, uh, which of course accumulates in Alzheimer's disease, is another stimulus for inflammatory response well, how does the changes in Brooks membrane lead to progression of disease? Well, that leads us to thinking about the changes in the chorea capillaris in age-related macular degeneration. As we get older, the chorea capillaris density decreases. In fact, uh, the thickness of the chorea decreases from around 200 to around 80 microns, just with age, not with age-related macular degeneration. But in age-related macular degeneration, you see even more exacerbated changes. Why does this occur? It could be due to the loss of vascular endothelial growth factor associated with the death of the RPE cells. On the right, you can see a plot of the RPE cell density as a function of time in human eyes. And you can see that we're losing RPE cells as we grow older. Um, and of course, in patients with that age-related macular degeneration in living patients, it's been documented that there's decreased oral blood flow and bond. We can actually visualize the changes in the capital. Um, this is post-mortem eyes. So this is a fundus photograph, the post-mortem eye, and the post-mortem eye where the retina's been removed. And with special stains, you can actually visualize the choreocapillaris. And you can see the normal choreocapillaris looks uniformly red. And if we look under high magnification, you can see that the diameter of the lumen is large and there are many connecting sinusoids. That's normal choreocapillaris in an old person. But if we look at an old person that has age-related macular degeneration, what we call early macular degeneration, we can see that the chorea capillaris actually now looks quite abnormal. There's decreased capillary density under the fovea with areas where there's simply no capillaries at all, and also the remaining capillaries are thin, and the connections among the capillaries are fewer. And if we compare that to the same patient, but looking slightly away from the fovea, this is what normal should look. And what's really interesting is in the area where the capillary density is low, we see very early neovascularization. So what this implies is that even in early age-related macular degeneration, there's active vascular remodeling of the choreocapillaris, probably to compensate for the loss of choreocapillaris associated with damage in A and B. Um, now, we talked about Brooks membrane, we talked about the chorea, now we're going to talk about AMD is associated with a chronic inflammatory response. For example, if we look at the molecular constituents of Drusen, 
you can see that there are complement receptors, complement factors, amyloid beta peptide. These are all uh, molecules associated with inflammatory response. And uh, in fact, if you look carefully, uh, you'll see uh, activated colloidal dendritic cells in the gross membrane, which is shown here, by the patients with age-related macular degeneration. And as I mentioned to you before, there are the most bioactive components of complement present in gross membrane of uh, AMDI, C3A and C5. <laughs> and interestingly enough, um, these actually induce VEGF expression in RPD cells. So this could help explain why confluent soft drusen are a risk factor for chlorodian vascularization, because confluent soft drusen are enriched in C3A and C5A. And of course, um, the inflammatory molecules in drusen helps to create the stimulus for chronic inflammation uh, in the gross membrane chorded capillaries complex. So when I was in residency, what we were taught was that the primary uh, cell that was damaged in age-related macular degeneration was the RPD cell. And this is an idea that I uh, really started with Michael Hogan in the 70s. But now what I believe is that the primary site of damage is actually the chorded capillaris, the secondary involvement of the RPD and then the photosynthesis. Drusen, geographic atrophy, coronia vascularization are all associated with mutations in the complement pathway. Factor H, factor B, C2, and C3, and C1. Mutations in all of those components have been associated with an increased risk of AMD. And uh, that inevitably leads to considering the genetics and the role of genetics in AMD. Obviously, there's a tendency to concordance in monozygotic twins. Uh, AMD, though, is probably a polygenic disorder, so these mimicking conditions like Amalatila lentinesa, which is a single gene mutation, really don't reproduce all the aspects of AMD. And I doubt that any animal model that has a single mutation in it is going to actually reproduce all the aspects of AMD. Um, the late onset of AMD actually is reminiscent of mitochondrial diseases. And in fact, there are certain mitochondrial haplotypes that are associated with an increased risk and a decreased risk of AMD. Um, it's interesting that 76% in one study of the attributable risk of developing AMD was due to mutations in just a few genes, complement factor H, ARMS2, C, and C3. And uh, having the high-risk mutations increase your risk by 14-fold, having the safe uh, uh, polymorphism decrease your risk by 20-fold. Uh, so you would think, therefore, we could use genetic testing to help uh, assess a patient's risk uh, for developing the late features of AMD, but in fact, uh, a sensitivity of um, 80, a predicted value of 86% is not really good enough for clinical use. Um, now, just to remind you about how the complement system works, uh, there are actually four major pathways. I'm not showing the fourth one, which is the fibrolytic activated extrinsic pathway. But there's a classical pathway, which is activated by antibody reactions, the lectin pathway that's activated by mannose binding lectin microbial surfaces, and the alternative pathway, which is activated by foreign surfaces. And activation of the complement system is important not only in immunity, but also in the clearing of the apricotic cells. And of course, inappropriate complement activation can damage tissue. That's how people can develop certain types of remoral glomerulonephritis, for example. Um, it turns out that mutations in many components of the complement pathway have been identified with an increased risk of AMD. Those are all circled in green. Some of them are probably not important, but some of them, like complement factor H, are very important. And the key thing to realize is that um, C3 is the point of convergence of the all four different pathways for the complement activation, because C3 eventually leads to the formation of what's called the membrane intact complex, as well as C3A and C5A, which are anaphylic processes. So variations in fact, complement factor H, C2, and complement factor B loci can predict the clinical outcome in a large percentage of AMD cases, but not in all cases. Um, if we look at mutations in AMD patients, about half of the unaffected controls have a protective haplotype of complement factor H, C2, or complement factor B. And 74% of the patients with AMD have no protective haplotype. So about half, slightly more than half the risk, 
uh, and slightly more than half the uh, protection that patients have for AMD comes uh, due to mutations in complement factor H. Uh, the uh, complement factor C2 and B are also important, but not as important. Um, what's interesting is if you look at where these complement components are located, they're in mostly the choroid, first membrane, and the endoduries. Let me show you. So this is a picture, an anatomic picture of a postmortem human eye. These are the RP cells. They're stained red with lipofusin. This is just a generic stain for albumin to show you the structure of the choroid. But if you look at factor D, it's present in the choroid and in the retina. These are the RP cells. If you look at factor H, it's mostly around the choriocapillaris and in the sapphires that are the choroid. If you look at C3, it has a very similar distribution, but it's also present in drusen and in some retinal hematopelia cells. If you look at factor B, it's throughout the choroid, but especially intense around the choriocapillaris. It's also um, a membrane attack complex is present in some drusen. And then if you look at the membrane attack complex, you can see how intensely stained the choriocapillaris is. These are the RP. Uh, and then if we look at a case of geographic atrophy, so here's the non-atrophic zone, here's the atrophic zone. You can see the RPE cells end where the atrophic zone begins. The membrane attack complex is present in the atrophic zone and in the area at the edge of atrophy, which is going to become atrophic. And then finally, if you look at the distribution of factor C5, it's present underneath the retinal pigment epithelial cells, but not in the choriocapillaris. And here we see membrane attack complex present underneath the RPE cells. So these data, you can see how it got people thinking that the primary site of damage may actually be in the choriocapillaris, growth stem brain, RPE, and not just in the RPE. How does oxidative damage fit into this picture? Well, oxidative damage can compromise the regulation of the complement system by RPE cells. Remember, the alternative complement pathway is always active always experiencing a low degree of activation, and unless we inhibit it, it will kill us. And what inhibits it is complement factor H. And for complement factor H to do that, it has to actually recognize uh, certain molecules on the surface of the cells that we want to protect ourselves versus the cells of saying that they do not work. So this is also true in our eye, not just in our systemic circulation. It turns out, unfortunately, that oxidative stress reduces the ability of RPE cells to modulate complement inhibition. And so you can see that oxidative damage combined with the complement factor H mutation is really going to put the RPE cells and the choriocapillaris at risk for immune-mediated destruction. Not only that, the sublytic activation of the complement system, in other words, activation of the complement system that doesn't cause formation of a membrane attack complex with destruction of the cell will activate VEGF production. And so you can see how we might see those small buds of neovascularization in early AMD, and of course, late onset neovascularization for people with severe disease. Uh, the, complement, the activation of the complement system by interferon is also compromised by oxy oxidative stress. And it turns out that even lipofusin uh, can trigger complement activation. And as we know, lipofusin accumulation occurs with aging, and it accumulates especially intensely in the periphobial area of um, people with age-related macular degeneration. So that may explain in part why the macula is preferentially affected in age-related macular degeneration. There's even an animal model uh, in which oxidative damage is linked to complement activation. This involves immunizing mice to something called carboxyethylperol, which is a oxidative fragment of docosahexaenoic acid, which is present in uh, photoreceptors and injuries in the AMD eyes. And these mice uh, fix complement C3 in the first membrane, they make drusen, and they get geographic action. Well, moving from uh, the early stages and intermediate stages of AMD, now I want to talk about the later stages of AMD, beginning with geographic atrophy. Uh, geographic atrophy is more common in Europeans uh, than it is in Asians, Africans, and Hispanics, as you can see here. Yeah. But it's a very important cause of legal blindness in the United States, especially now that we have anti vegf treatments for the investments. And as I'm sure you know, the areas of atrophy typically occur uh, initially in the extrophobia region and then progressing in the phobia. 
But even when the current flow of your region is affected, patient's vision is affected, um, but if one, once the flow of your center is involved, then you have severe visual loss. Uh, when it's not involved directly, you have impaired vision because of the difficulty with um, uh, fixation and reading an entire word as opposed to a fraction of a word. Um, now, there, there are different patterns of geographic factors you can have. The most common are multifocal, non confluent areas and a large confluent area. Um, what's interesting is if we look at the concordance of the right eye to the left eye, just anatomically speaking, there's a very high correlation of concordance. So the right eye eventually looks exactly like the left eye, although it may not do so simultaneously. What there's less concordance with uh, is the visual acuity. You see R.02 versus R.44. Why is that? Because there may be small areas that we can't appreciate clinically that where there's some foveal preservation and, and where we would expect there to be a loss of vision eventually, but where it hasn't happened yet. Um, many people have tried to identify specific uh, genetic risk factors for the geographic atrophy, and I can summarize it by saying it, it's an incomplete story. But there are certain alleles of the ARMS2 gene. Uh, there are certain alleles of complement factor H. Uh, they're associated with the so-called diffuse trickling phenotype that seems to have a higher rate of progression in geographic atrophy. Uh, and there are certain uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms associated with C3 that seem to be associated in some studies with increased risk for geographic atrophy. I, I don't think any of that's clinically relevant yet. What may be important is the issue about the complement factor I. As you know, uh, Genentech is in the middle of a phase three trial looking at lambolizumab as a treatment to reduce the rate of spread of geographic atrophy. And in a phase two study that was conducted, the patients who had the complement factor I mutation seemed to be the ones who experienced the greatest benefit. But their benefit was based on the fact that the patients with the complement factor I mutation had a very high rate of progression. That high rate of progression hasn't been confirmed in the subsequent study, so it, it isn't clear to me how the mentalism that trial will come out. Looking at the anatomy of geographic atrophy, this is the same set of uh, studies as before, where we have a fundus photograph, a post-mortem eye, and then the eye with the retina removed. And then looking at the eye with the retina removed, using special stains to look at the choroid. If we look inside the area of geographic atrophy, you can see that there are many open spaces. The lumen diameter of the chorea capillaris is very narrow, and the surface area covered by the chorea capillaris is very rough. And if we look at the edge of atrophy, we can see that um, just on the other side, there's a more normal, although quite, not quite normal, appearance of the choroid. We can look histologically and see something very similar. In, in the eye of geographic atrophy, in the zone that has no atrophy, the chorea capillaris and the RP normal. In the area where we're at the border zone of atrophy, the RPE are hypertrophic, and the chorea capillaris is beginning to degenerate. And in the area of atrophy, we see no RPE and no chorea capillaris. We can even look up structurally and see that in the non-atrophic area, the chorea capillaris look normal. In the border zone, we see vacuolization that can vary in extent. And then in the area of atrophy, we see a collapsed chorea capillary cell with no lumen just mostly based on memory. Now these changes in the chorea capillaris, and you don't have this slide in your handout because it's rather theoretical, but it's interesting. Um, when you have loss of the chorea capillaris, you have less heat dissipation in the core. And that actually can increase complement activation, and it can accumulate inside the cell something called alveolar-RNA. And these changes can actually induce uh, something known as the NLPR3 inflammasome, which mediates an intraocular and intracellular inflammatory response. And it turns out that when this gets activated, you precipitate the development of atrophy and probably coronal vascularization. And what's really interesting is that the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, which have been used to treat um, HIV, they actually inhibit the activation of the NLPR3 inflammasome. So this may be a whole new class of drugs that might turn out to be a useful treatment. Uh, for the progression of geographic atrophy and possibly for the vascularization. Well, atrophy occurs in a, under very different circumstances that I want to outline. There is outer retinal atrophy, which is a 
associated with regression of reticular pseudoadrenals. I'll tell you what reticular pseudoadrenals are in more detail in a minute. Um, there's classical geographic atrophy, which is typically associated with basal linear deposit. And, there's, and related to that is the atrophy that occurs after pigment epithelial attachment is flattened. And then there's the atrophy associated with coronal neovascularization, which may not be a well-recognized phenomenon, but it's very well described, actually. So let's start with outer retinal atrophy with reticular pseudodrusin. Here you can see on the right, a patient uh, at time zero with a subretinal drusenoid deposits. These are deposits of material not underneath the RPE cells, but between the RPE and the photoreceptors. And over time, they regress. And when they regress, Histologically and clinically with the OCT, you can see decreased photoreceptor length and loss of the ellipsoid band and thinning of the coral. That's, this is what it looks like histologically. The subretinal drusenoid deposits are present between the photoreceptors and the RPE, and you can see that the apical those processes of the RPE wrap around this material. Under higher magnification, you can see the drusenoid deposits and the those processes of the RPE, and basal lamina deposit underneath the RPE. Now, the subretinal drusenoid deposits preferentially accumulate in the peripheral area, and if you look carefully, you'll see that the photoreceptors outer segments over the deposits are abnormal. So these photoreceptors are not functioning uh, efficiently. And if we wonder, well, what is this material? If you look at uh, ultrastructurally, you'll see that the drusenoid deposits uh, mainly consist of membranous whorls, uh, and these globular proteins, as opposed to the basal linear deposit, which is underneath the RPE cell shown here, which is mostly membranous debris. But they don't just look different ultrastructurally, they are different biochemically. So subtretinal drusenoid deposits don't have any esterified cholesterol in them, whereas basal linear deposit has lots of esterified cholesterol. Subretinal drusenoid deposits have a lot of unesterified and uh, basal linear deposit also has unesterified cholesterol. So they're different materials. Um, if we look clinically, what you can see is that um, when the subretinal drusenoid deposits regress, you get atrophy of the outer retina. We, um, it's not so easy to see at this magnification, but over a period of 3.5 years, you lose these subretinal drusenoid deposits, and the result is you only have a little ellipsoid band this will be shown much more clearly here. If we look at time zero, you can see the thickness of the outer nuclear layer. And at um, 63 months, the outer nuclear layer is very thin. And whereas you see the subretinal drusenoid deposits here, you don't see them at 36 months. And if you look carefully, you'll even see that the choroid is somewhat thinner at 36 months. So that's the atrophy associated with subretinal drusenoid deposit. Now, what about our typical classical geographic atrophy? Well, that has sharply demarcated lesions, boundaries, uh, markedly reduced spinous autofluorescence. Uh, we don't say it's present unless there's at least uh, 178 micron diameter area of atrophy. It's, of course, not due to blockage. Uh, and we usually want to attribute this to AMD unless the patient has some other manifestation like drusen or pigmentation. Well, um, if we now look at the evolution of this more classical geographic atrophy, the first thing we'll notice is that outer segment length decreases in areas where the RPE are most highly elevated. So if we look at the areas shown by this arrow, the RPE are very highly elevated, but the outer segment length is very small. In contrast, right next to this, there's an area where the RPE are not elevated, and you can see that the outer segment length is much long, longer. Um, What's interesting is that the loss of retinal sensitivity is correlated most clearly with the loss of the ellipsoid signal. But related to that is the height of the RPE, and so that's why we see sensitivity decreasing as the height of the RPE elevation increases. Well, when we finally get into the area of evolution of atrophy, clinically evident, I'm sorry to say that we are not much ahead of where we were in 1988. So, I'm going to show you what Dr. Sarks described in 1988. He said that incipient atrophy in the junctional zone, drusen begin regressing. So the first thing is drusen regression. But before the drusen are regressed, we see an ultrastructural change in the RPE. 
they begin to make a lot of base around the deposit, and there can be calcification in the fluids. And then in the area of atrophy, there are no more fusing, and the uh, cells have some processes, collagen fibers, and calcium. So now I'm going to show you what that looks like histologically. This is early atrophy, and what we can see here is there are no photoreceptors, there is no RPE here, and um, there is loss of the external limiting membrane. That marks the area where you now have lost the photoreceptors. And underneath here, you have basolinear deposits. So clinically, this person would have a soft roots that we could recognize clinically. And underneath it, there's no patent for your capillaries. So you see, by the time we can recognize these roots, many bad things have already happened to the RPE, the choroid, and the retina. This is an area of advanced atrophy where we can see um, basal lamina deposit, which doesn't go away, whereas the basal linear deposit does go away. We see that there's no photocapillaris, and we see there are few residual photoreceptors which tend to be trans. We've all seen calcified drusen, and what does that correlate histologically? Well, first we start with a druse that uh, when fungus autofluorescence can have a ring of hypofluorescence, but then over a period of 30 months, it becomes calcified, the fluorescence picture changes dramatically. And if we look at this patient with OCT, what we'll see is a calcified drusen casting a shadowing of the deeper structures due to calcification. And if we look histologically with the Vancasa stain, we can see that there's uh, calcium in the basal linear deposit. Uh, it even remains in Brooks membrane and in the necrotic RPE cells once they go. The junctional zone uh, is something that we can also visualize clinically, so I'll show you first histologically what it looks like. The area of hyperfluorescence, fundus autofluorescence, that you're all accustomed to seeing at the junction of uh, geographic atrophy and the edge of atrophy, actually most typically is based on RPE hyperplasia, not based on increased uh, lipofusin accumulation. And what you can see here is that over this area, we have living photoreceptors. In fact, the even living photoreceptors that extend into the area where we would see no fungus autofluorescence at all. Um, we can look at areas of atrophy using uh, adaptive optics scanning laser ophthalmoscopy, um, which is shown here, where you can visualize individual cone photoreceptors. Those are the little white dots. This is an area of atrophy. And this um, area is visualized 12 months later. Uh, and you can see that we can actually study the very same cone photoreceptors 12 months later. Now, it's probably easier just to summarize what the AOSLO data have shown. And what they show is that you see abnormalities in the cone photoreceptor mosaic uh, with the progression of atrophy, probably because you lose the outer segments, which um, alter the uh, light signal coming from the AOSLO system. Um, so when we, when we look at the OCT shown on the right and compared to the atrophy shown on the left, in the area where there is no fundus autofluorescence uh, for the OCT, we see the hyperreflective signal. And here we have no RP cells, no photocapillaries, and no photoreceptors. Uh, if we look at the margin of ellipsoid disruption, we can see that that actually is where um, the uh, outer segments are lost, but we still have an external limiting membrane. So the margin of the external limiting membrane disrupt disruption is very closely correlated with the margin of RPE loss, and that's very closely correlated with where the hyperreflectivity zone is on the OCT. Um, and this area is where we see the increased fundus autofluorescence, as I just mentioned. And you can see that inside the area where we have no fundus autofluorescence, we actually have a link the other way we see atrophy, of course, is with the collapse of pigment epithelial attachments. And once you have a drusenoid PED, you have about a 50% chance of developing atrophy in seven years. But if the PED is more than two this diameter in size, you're very likely to see atrophy occur within two years. Now, what about PEDs in geographic atrophy? Well, there are some factors that can help you predict the development of it. For example, if we look at time zero, you can see that there is a heterogeneous internal reflectivity. That's a bad sign. You can see that there are retinal hyperreflective foci on the surface. That's a bad sign. And in fact, if you look 27 months later, you see that atrophy has developed. Not only that, 
Um, if we look with the AOSLO, we'll see that in areas uh, where you have lost the ellipsoid signal, there's increased cone spacing compared to areas where the ellipsoid signal remains intact. And if we want to quantify this, it turns out that the presence of the hyperreflective foci is the single greatest predictor of development of geographic atrophy. The heterogeneous internal reflectivity is less important. Interestingly enough, the hydro PED is not that important. Uh, and the presence uh, of the lower penny also predicts the development of geographic atrophy in that particular locus. So, to summarize what I've been trying to parlay uh, the histology with the clinical findings, if we look at the area of the loss of fundus autofluorescence, what does it correlate strictly with? It correlates strictly with the area of coronal signal enhancement. It correlates strictly with the area of RP attenuation. Um, you can see the external limiting membrane loss, though, is internal to that region uh, somewhat. The outer nuclear area loss is much internal to that region. Uh, and the area where we lose the outer segments and the inner segments is external to that, to that region. And just for your own interest, I provide the quantitative data which illustrates these points to you. I don't, I don't intend to repeat it now plainly because it's so funny. Now there's, I've been showing you a bunch of transverse images uh, with OCT, but I want to show you a different way of looking at the OCT, which is very instructive. It's on fos imaging of OCT. And uh, this work is done by Dr. Rosenfeld in Miami and his colleagues. So here you see a color fundus photo, fundus autofluorescence, this is an on fos OCT where we're looking at the level of the RPE, and now here we're looking at the level of the inner segment, outer segment junction. And the reason I'm showing you this is to make the point that, remember, the first thing that happens when the photoreceptors get sick before they're dead is they lose their outer segments. So you can see that the area of outer segment abnormality around this region of geographic atrophy is not uniform. I would have thought that there'd be a uniform amount of photoreceptor damage around the margin of atrophy, but that's not the case. Here, there's much less photoreceptor damage than there is over here. Why that is, I don't know. But it, it, it's an important detail if you're designing studies to, to mark the progression of atrophy. Now, what does the fundus autofluorescence mean? You know, I can tell you what I'm sure it means, and then I can speculate what I think. What I know for sure is that during the evolution of geographic atrophy, in some areas, you will see an increase in fundus autofluorescence. Eventually, that decreases. You can see atrophy progressing areas that don't have an increase in fundus autofluorescence. Though. And initially, it was thought that dying RP would be cyclopusin and the adjacent RP would it, and that's why you get the increased atrophy. That hypothesis turns out not to be true. But Looking at these patterns have led to a variety of ways of characterizing and trying to predict who's going to develop atrophy the fastest. And of course, this is the work of Dr. Holtz and his colleagues. But if we look at the tissue histologically, we see something that isn't intuitively obvious, and it's shown here. This is work by Dr. Kirchner. Histologically, the autofluorescence and isogeographic atrophy is actually most commonly associated with the superimposition of RPE cells, as well as the deposition of autofluorescence. So for example, here's an area of high autofluorescence, and what do we see? We see a doubling of the RPE. Here's an area of low autofluorescence, we see a single RPE. Same thing in a totally different region. Where you see increased autofluorescence, histologically you see multiverse RPEs. So the um, variability, the thing that really accounts for the changes in fungus autofluorescence turns out to be variability in the RPE. And um, areas with advanced RP abnormalities are most likely to cause the patterns of elevated fungus autofluorescence around the margin of atrophy to be recognized clinically. Um, and as I mentioned to you before, increased fungus autofluorescence does not correlate with RP cells that have gotten more like Houston. It correlates with stacks of RP cells that have gotten more like In fact, you have many dysmorphic RP cells that are not high. And the reason that's important is that that tells you that you're going to see geographic atrophy progress in areas that do not exhibit increased fungus autofluorescence. And unfortunately, the sensitivity of fungus autofluorescence for detecting new areas of atrophy is only about 75%, which may mean that studies like the Amixosat study are, have an inherent design problem for identifying whether the drug worked or not. 
and it may in part explain the negative results of the um, So, uh, in fact, uh, it's been shown that you see RP degeneration occurring before the fungus auto fluorescence becomes evident. For example, abnormalities in complement regulation. Loss of the fungus auto fluorescence. So, not only does the absence of fungus auto fluorescence not mean that the RP cell is healthy. The loss of fungus autofluorescence doesn't even mean that the RP cell is gone. So here's an example where you have loss of fungus autofluorescence that's simply due to loss of lipofusin. Here's another example in with a very abnormal looking cell, which we would, if we were looking at fungus autofluorescence, we would guess the cell is healthy, but in fact it's not at all. It's very abnormal shape. Um, and then here's a person who's going to have no fungus autofluorescence because their RP cell is filled with melanosomes. You'll see those cells are near infrared autofluorescence, but not on fungus autofluorescence as you can tell. How the, uh, how the lipofusin granules leave the cell isn't really known, but it's possible that they, they bind with melanin or lipofusin, and that actually may be shown here, where we see lipofusin and melanin and lipofusin combined. But the sh these, these pictures show you what happens to RP cells before atrophy develops. And we don't have any way of imaging these changes in a living person, at least not at the moment. You see intracellular stress fibers, frayed cytoskeleton, abnormally enlarged cells, and, and at the moment, this is what we would like to be able to see in order to do studies of drugs that interfere with geographic active progression, but we don't have a test. Well, now let's talk about coronal vascularization. This is a slide that shows the Druze, but what it's also showing is a very early stage of coronary vascularization coming right into the soft trees. Now, Dr. Sartes, uh, as far as I know, is the first to recognize that coronary vascularization, even untreated, is associated with the progression of the atrophy. This happens to be a treated patient. Uh, the person had coronary vascularization shown with a red, with white arrow, and they got laser treatment, and by four months after the laser treatment, you can see uh, an area of atrophy pointed out by the black arrow. And by seven months, the area of atrophy has increased, and it's even increased further by year eight. In fact, the area of atrophy doubled between month seven and year eight. And it continues to expand by year 13, shown in that white arrow. If we look histologically at this patient, what you'll see is that, of course, in the area of the neovascularization, uh, you have atrophy with photoreceptors in RTD. But in the area at the edge, anterior to the edge of the neovascular complex, you have geographic atrophy. And in fact, if you go beyond the area of clinically evident atrophy, you'll see very abnormal photoreceptors, RPE, and photocatalytics. So uh, to summarize the geographic atrophy part, uh, it occurs in four related but distinguishable settings. Atrophy occurs in association with the disappearance of subretinous and deposits, in association with flattening of hidden epithelial detachments, in association with a loss of fungus autofluorescence associated with large drusen uh, resolution or recalcification of drusen, and in association with maturation of coronary vessels. Uh, there, we're continuing to try to develop genotype phenotype correlations, but these studies are in progress. Uh, currently available fungus autofluorescence technology does not allow us to identify the areas, all the areas, that are going to develop atrophy, which is a real problem for clinical trial. And coronary vessels are regularly associated with the development of atrophy. And the reason that's important is because if a treatment induces regression of the coronary vessels, we expect to see increased area of atrophy, not due to the treatment, but due to the um, exposure of an underlying area of atrophy. And not only that, if we treat a vessel successfully, we expect the atrophy to continue to progress unless we, our treatment specifically interferes with the progression. So now, uh, let's finish up by talking about coronary vascularization. I was taught that in order to have coronary vascularization, you have to have a, book, a break in book's membrane. That's absolutely wrong. The coronary vessels create the breaks in book's membrane. The breaks in book's membrane don't precede the development of the coronary vessels. Here we can see um, a, a clinical pathological correlation of what the photocapillaris looks like around coronary vascularization. And what you can see, and I don't think you need to be a to see this, is that the coronary vessel 
which is shown here on the right hand of the patient, is surrounded by areas of chorea papillaris drop out. So that leads to the idea that chorea vascularization is actually a, um, a homeostatic response to inadequate choroidal blood flow. And if you look in the periphery of this very same patient, the chorea papillaris is wrong. We can look at this sort of change of, uh, histologically, and what you can see is that uh, just outside the area of coronia vascularization, the RP cells are hypertrophic, and there is some loss in chorea capillaris. And where the coronia vessel is located, it grows in the cleavage plane created by the basolinear deposit. The RPE are very abnormal, and the chorea capillaris are atrophic. And this is shown even uh, more clearly with Dr. Sarks's uh, ultrastructural studies that go back to the 70s. Here we're looking at a choroidal vessel growing in the cleavage plane created by the basolinear deposit. And underneath this choroidal vessel, there is simply no chorea capillaris present, which is just what you saw um, with uh, uh, light crossing. Well, there's a, another type of choroidal vascularization, a cycle type 1, which I just showed you, called retinogeomous proliferation. And to understand that, we need to just quickly look at the anatomy of the circulation. So the retina has a superficial capillary plexus and an intermediate capillary plexus and a deep capillary plexus. And that provides blood flow to the inner two thirds of the retina. And then as you know, the chorea capillaris provides blood flow to the outer one third to the photo centers. Well, in retinal angiomatous proliferation, which is shown here, uh, we have uh, two lesions actually in this picture, a high flow lesion shown in the yellow arrows and a low flow lesion shown in the green arrows. And you can see those lesions on the EOCT. The high flow lesion is here, it's in the retina, obviously, and the low flow region is clearly in the retina. So this is abnormal vascularization in A and B, but in the retina, not in the core, originally in the retina. How does that happen? I'm gonna tell you. Um, here you can see the same patient, same lesion, but using OCT and geography. This may be, as far as I can tell, the first clinical use for OCT and geography, which is to monitor the successive retreatment by looking at the flow rate of the abnormal vessel. Now, the, as it turns out, the high flow lesion uh, looks just the same as a low flow lesion. But in fact, the reason is that this is saturated. The actual brightness pixels are much higher here than they are here. And the brightness is related to the rate of flow. Well, retinal geometrist proliferation is associated with an increased risk of developing an atrophy. That's shown in this patient. So here the patient is in October 2004 with a rat lesion. And then four years later, they've developed two areas of atrophy, shown by the white areas. And in fact, uh, Dr. Uh, Lois and her colleagues show that in areas of rat, there's about an 88% chance of developing atrophy. And this turns out to be the major uh, site-limiting feature of rat lesions. Um, and you can imagine that a lot of uh, what I've been talking about is related to hypoxia. And you probably all know that hypoxia increases VEGF levels both by increasing VEGF mRNA transcription and by stabilizing VEGF mRNA. And as you now know, choroidal vessels usually develop in areas of uh, choroidal ischemia. Uh, what we don't know is if the choroidal uh, blood flow abnormalities actually do lead to hypoxia, which would increase VEGF production, or perhaps uh, if the changes in Brooks membrane could lead to nutrient uh, diffusion abnormalities that precipitate the production of VEGF. Um, hypoxia inducible uh, factor one, though, probably plays a very important role. Now, this slide, I think you have this picture in your handout. Do you? You haven't been given? Okay. Well, then I'm going to try to show you this picture. Uh, there's a way to do this, you have to forgive me. Got a quick PowerPoint. And I've got it right now. Now I go here. Let's see if this works.
So um, hypoxia, so oxidative stress leads to increased production of hypoxia-inducible factor one. And that leads to the production of a variety of cytokines, angiopoietin, um, vascular endothelial protein tyrosine phosphatase, VEGF, uh, platelet-derived growth factor, um, stromal-derived growth factor, and placental growth factor. So as you know, VEGF causes vascular leakage, and in combination with NH2 and DPTP causes the vessel sprouting. Uh, the VEGF and stromal-derived growth factor and uh, placental growth factor um, provide liquid bone marrow cells, which fosters neovascularization. Uh, the platelet-derived growth factor B recruits parasites, which allows the um, vessels to become mature and resistant to VEGF transition. And now we get to adrenaline filtration. When the VEGF levels are high enough in the outer retina, that is what will create the formation of retinal neovascularization as a manifestation of age-related macular degeneration. Um, whereas, when the VEGF levels are higher enough at the level of the RP gross membrane, then you get the typical type 1 corrupt neovascularization. So I'm trying to connect all the histology I've shown you with what's known about um, the biochemistry of corrupt neovascularization. What about polyporophoric neovascularization? Well, even in PCV, and as you can see, here we have the polyps, and here we have the type 1 CNV, the branching uh, neovascular organization that's also known as the double dose sign. Um, if we look at the high flow lesion, the PCV branching lesion, around it, you see areas of either no photocapillaries or very low blood flow in photocapillaries. So I think even PCV reflects this pathogenesis. Now, um, Angiogenesis involves a number of steps. Uh, first, we have angiogenic factor production, like hypoxia is factor one. Then we have the release of angiogenic substances like VEGF. And then we have binding to the VEGF receptors or analogous receptors with intracellular signal systems activating, leading to endothelial cell proliferation, directional migration, remodeling of the extracellular matrix. That's how it grows through the basal membrane deposit. That's how it breaks through the gross membrane. Then tube formation, loop formation, and eventually the maturation of the vessel. And you can see that there are a number of substances that stimulate and a number of substances that inhibit this process. And that sets up the possibility for developing a variety of treatments for coronary vessels. And in fact, if you want to know just a fraction of what's out there, uh, there's the inhibition of angiogenic factor production through complement modulators. We have substances that inhibit angiogenic factor growth factor that inhibit the binding of uh, cytokines to the receptors, that inhibit endothelial cell receptor activation, signaling in other words, that inhibit proliferation and migration, tube formation, and vascular stabilization. And many of these have failed. Some of them are in practice these days. And, and many of them are still being studied. And we'll get into that in the second lecture, uh, at the end of the second lecture. But to summarize about the pathology, uh, the things that I think are absolutely true that you can take home. Uh, Brooks membrane changes are an important part of AMD. Thickening, lipidization, protein crossing. Complement activation is an important part of AMD at the level particularly of the corticapillaris RP and Rosina. There's a decrease in the density and the diameter of the corticapillaris with aging, but particularly with AMD, even early AMD. Uh, atrophy of the RP, corticapillaris, and photoreceptors follows as does the development of the vessels. The questions that are unanswered and which probably represent the areas for the drug development are the role of hypoxia in early AMD, the role of oxidative damage in early AMD, the role of this NLPR3 inflammasome, which may lead to new treatments for geographic atrophy, uh, and the role of cytokines other than VEGF, and some of which I'll show you in the second lecture. So that's the end of the first lecture, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. But no matter what, I'd like to take a five-minute break and get a cup of coffee and then we can get
I encourage you to get up and walk around. I can't sit for another nine hours straight. And then uh, we'll start talking.